Hello and welcome back everyone. Happy Thursday. Today we will be doing a rundown of Dev Diary 108, which is talking about the spheres of influence, a general overview, as well as an overview of the patch alongside it, which is going to be 1.7. I wanted to briefly mention that there is no update for any sort of hotfix within this development diary as it relates to 1.6, uh, and so this will not be appearing here, but there, by the time this gets published, there might be an update in regards to already put out by Paradox, but as of right now, nothing regarding a hotfix. And so, let's jump into it. Dev Diary 106, hello and welcome to the development diary for one of, uh, for the 1.7 update and Spheres of Influence expansion pack. Notably, this is the first big, big boy, big pants uh, expansion pack for Victoria 3, and it's got a lot of features coming up. Uh, it's going to be released on May 6th, just a reminder to all of you. This development diary is meant to give you a broad overview of the major, I hope I said May 6th, a uh, broad overview of the major expansion pack and update features, which we will naturally go over in much greater detail over the next few weeks. Expect a lot of happy Thursdays to come. As mentioned previously, all of this is scheduled to release on May 6th, and you can pre-order Spheres of Influence now. All right, big nice. Um, and so it's just kind of a quick rundown of all the features. You can see here just about a paragraph on each of them, uh, but we will be kind of uh, going through each of these one by one. So starting off first, Power blocks. Power blocks are multinational associations that can be formed by high-ranking countries. I assume this will require at least major power plus, and which take a, a variety of forms based on identity and principles. So we have two kind of pillar mechanics. We've seen this and we've inferred a lot of this from uh, the various screenshots, um, you know, it's various screens and video or various videos and streams, but um, we are getting a little bit more info here. Power block identities are set when they're formed, they are locked in, while principles can be added and removed over time. Power blocks are are highly customizable in other ways, such as choosing the name and customizing the emblem, as well as creating uh, custom statues to reflect the glory of your block. A power block might take the form of a single great power and can and countries under its influence, a multilateral military alliance between several major or great powers. And I think this is important uh, to note that this implies that, you know, it's not going to necessarily be an overlord and subjects type of mechanic necessarily. You can have shared power or so, this type of thing, or an economic cooperation with numerous countries in a unified market. And this one I find also very intriguing because it says unified market. Um, and to this maybe implies to me that we can see customs union where there's not a single overlord, which I'm not sure what the implications of are, are this, but it was interesting to see this unified market rather than uh, a single market, uh, which would be kind of the other way you would maybe type that out. Power blocks have leverage on countries outside of the block. Um, including members of other blocks, uh, and can use that leverage to entice and control them into the power block. Uh, so this is, leverage is going to be, I guess, a new diplomatic uh, mechanic, and I'm guessing trying to acquire leverage is going to be an important or interesting thing. Maybe having a huge trade volume with someone will give you leverage, or vice versa. Uh, per, uh, being a part of a power block comes with both benefits and obligations, so we can expect some sort of bonuses, as well as uh, need to like maybe defend them, or this type of thing, or have to pay money, and this sorts of thing and members are at risk of having their internal politics meddled with by the leader of the block um the leader okay so this is happening from the top down okay uh and i assume like for example if if you have a block whose uh, intention is like a market block i assume this will allow you to enforce something like free trade um on, on members of your block or something like this or if it's a military alliance perhaps professional army or this sort of thing Interest group lobbies in Spheres of Influence is another mechanic that we have coming up, which is going to allow interest groups to uh, have a lot more say in regards to international affairs, which they should. And I think this is going to lead to interesting play patterns. I'm very excited for this one. In Spheres of Influence, interest groups can now join lobbies with specific foreign policy agendas centered around other countries. These lobbies form organically and as a result of the new system of diplomatic catalysts. So this is an entirely new mechanic, diplomatic catalysts. A lobbying friendly, which we'll get later in the paragraph, a lobbying friendly to Great Britain or a lobby friendly to Great Britain might form after the signing of an alliance with them, while a lobby hostile to Austria might spring up after being defeated by them in a war. And this is pretty interesting. So we can, uh, you know, try and manipulate the various interest groups to forming issues here uh, or issues or interests in international affairs and the fact that you know uh, uh, an industrialist or an intelligentsia sort of interest group might make it harder for you to go to war all the time like the current meta for victoria 3 doesn't really encourage this sort of playing tall uh, and playing nice type of thing it encourages you to just acquire resources as efficiently as possible with pretty much everyone universally and there's not much um uh there's not much texture to like what 
what optimal looks like. But if we if we play in a certain way, and this gives us certain interest groups that have certain lobbies that force us to play a different way diplomatically, this is interesting. All depending on a variety of diplomatic and uh, diplomatic and political conditions at the time of the catalyst occurred, lobbies will try and promote or counter the interests of foreign powers, or and will help or hinder your diplomatic efforts based on whether or not they align with their own. So you could try and intentionally form these catalysts in order to spark something. So interesting. Uh, lobbies that are friendly to a specific foreign power can smooth the uh, the way for diplomatic agreement, and this is probably going to be like this. Just sounds so interesting to me. Like. Um, is there a way that we can try and intentionally spark these? Because a lot of uh, interesting or a lot of starts kind of hinge around a certain diplomatic relation. To usually your th pie not getting thumbed. Uh, and if there are ways to kind of, uh, you know, center your play around this type of thing, maybe because by making the lobby more powerful so that it can help you out more, this would be pretty interesting. Uh, agreement that would otherwise not be possible, will, but will oppose hostile actions and uh, undermine any war efforts. Now, I don't know if this means your war score will tick down lower. I really hope that they change the war system so that it's not got, it doesn't have this like, uh, this zero uh, tick away at zero and auto enforce at a hundred type of thing. Um, I, I'm not a huge fan of the system. If it just sparked multiple revolutions in your country, this would be sufficient to force you to come to the peace table, but um, we'll see. Um, while unfriendly lobbies will try and hinder diplomatic efforts uh, with the country of their ire, but might create an opportunity for key alliance with their rival instead. Okay, and we see here, we have a little bit of a screenshot seeking to escape the ex uh, accusations of communism by drawing a hard foreign policy line. The social democrat leadership of the trade unions have laid groundwork for a lobby to oppose, so oppose Soviet interest. Interesting. The revolution is betrayed. Uh, the new anti-country lobby, political lobby created, targeting the uh, Union of uh, Socialist Republics. Anti-country lobby is uh, the name of the lobby. Or it's not the name of the lobby, I guess it's the type of the lobby. Okay, we also have foreign investment. Uh, now there's an important distinction to be made here. You can invest in any country with spheres of influence, uh, DLC it looks like, but only subjects without it. Foreign investment uh, makes it both possible for governments and autonomous private investments investors, and autonomous private investors is probably an important one, to construct a building level in other countries and enjoy the profit generated. To construct in another country, you will have to have certain diplomats in place, or diplomatic plaques in place, otherwise, or otherwise be powered a power block that allows such construction. So we're either going to need to force them to allow us to build there, which I think, uh, I'm, I'm hoping this is a sort of play that you can enact, where you can force others to have this asymmetric relation where you can build in their country, but they can't build in yours, which may, <laughs> which may Makes it so you can do stuff perhaps uh, like building all the agrarian goods in someone else's country although this will give you ownership in your own if you do not own spheres of influence you will only be able to do it in your subjects as we mentioned the great game this is spheres of influence content and this is going to be uh, for uh, you know the Central Asia the power struggle between the UK and Russia will be the flavor appeal to Russia petition Great Britain for ba aid Afghan reunification we see a little bit of an event here uh, the great game spheres of influence uh, the great game is a major new content addition uh, adding a new objective and new journal entry uh, new journal entries rather focused on the historical great game that played out between Russia and Britain in Central Asia the objective can be either uh, can be played as either Russia Britain or one of the other involved powers such as Persia and which country you select changes the conditions required to win the great game and I really like this thing um, we have or one of the powers involved, such as Persia. So apparently there's going to be a lot of flavor for other countries. I don't know if it's going to be for every single country, but maybe the Sikh Empire will get some interesting flavor. Persia, where you can try and come out, out on top and sort of unify Central Asia. We'll see how that plays out. Uh, the new objective ties directly into numerous journal entries, such as Persia's ambition to restore its hegemony over Afghanistan, most of which will be present, even if the objective isn't selected, so that the, it will drive AI behavior in the region. So no longer will this be just like the place you go for opium, and instead it will have interesting stuff going on, and it will be the place to go for opium. Big nice. We have subject interactions, and this one, uh, of all of these, this one seems the least exciting to me, but let's go through it. Subject interactions are a new group of diplomatic actions that can be done uh, either by an overlord against their subjects or by a subject against their overlord. These actions include, uh, these actions such as increasing or decreasing autonomy, this is already present in game, so I, I'm not certain if they mean that they're changing it or what's going on here. Um, uh, changing the level of payments owned by the subject, appointing a ruler, a new ruler. This one's maybe a bit interesting, but we'll see. 
Um, certainly, if you can import, uh, <laughs> appoint someone who is of a particular interest group, if they have something like a presidency or a monarchy, this will actually make it easier to force laws in their country with the current mechanics, but those mechanics are likely to change, I assume, given that this is a thing, or allowing them to manage their own market. I don't know what this is going to mean. Is this just kick them out of your market? And then I generally think that that's a bad thing, So, uh, but maybe there's reason to want the option. Like, if you do it, maybe this will force a rev in their country, and you do it just to ruin their country um, so that they rev, uh, so that they need help. Uh, certain subject actions, such as increasing uh, autonomy or granting market independence, will be available even without the spheres of influence. Um, Wait, this only has increasing autonomy. Man, it's gonna be that's gonna be a vibe if you can't decrease autonomy without spheres of influence. That's like a very important thing. I hope that's not the case, uh, because that's a very important play pattern. Otherwise, you can't subjugate and then annex people. Or, but maybe it's less important when you can build in their country. But I, I'm not sure how I feel about that. If that's the case, we'll see. Now, this is one of the biggest things here. Building ownership or revision in update 1.7, so this is without spheres. The mechanics for building ownership are completely revised in 1.7 so that the owners of the building no longer have to work in that building or even live in that state. Um, and it's important that they're separating it from the building, not having um, extra owners uh, at both at the state level and like uh, the state, the ownership state and the place where the thing is built, a uh, place where the manufacturing or whatever it is is built. Um, it's important that they're not double dipping so we don't have extra pops because that hurts performance. But here we have London based uh, capitalists can now own buildings all over the world and buildings can be selectively nationalized or privatized uh, and put up for sale uh, to invest interested investors with available options being restricted by which economic system the country is currently operating under. This is so big because Playing tall right now doesn't work. Um, you know, you have to just keep expanding. You have to feed the bees for resources. And fundamentally, the attitude you have in the game currently uh, is you just expand resources and you declare wars as efficiently as possible you can with the infamy, with the idea of securing as much, um, securing as much resources as possible. And so this is how you play. But with this, you can get the resources just by building in other people's uh, countries. Uh, as long as they're in your market, it will put the resources into the market, right? And then you will consume them at your like sort of home base for the manufacturing. And you can have the ownership of all those resources at the uh, you know at the key states or at the homelands which will allow you to just absolutely balloon up the economic activity really raise average SOL imagine how much your SOL is going to climb up if if you have like a few smattering of normal buildings but half the people in your in a given state uh, are all of the ownership class because they just own stuff overseas and you get to have all the rich people back at home it's going to make a huge difference I think and just dramatically like overhaul the metagame so this I'm very, very excited for. Additionally, buildings can now potentially have different owners for each of its levels. I don't know how I feel about this, because um, I assume this creates more pop entities, but it's necessary if you're going to, you know, have a system where you're buying and selling and carving up. Also, um, you know, there's this, uh, I think that they selectively nationalized or privatized, um, so you can build in other people's countries. Uh, and so I think that, you know, you're going to be, uh, the way you built tall is going to be how Great Britain built tall during industrialization, which was forcing their way into other people's markets, making them buy the goods. Like the, they made it so that the uh, East India Company was not allowed to build uh, uh, textile mills so that they would have an effective monopoly. And then they took all the like dyes and stuff from them and then sold them the textiles back. Uh, and so we could have relationships with the, of this type you know in the game like with this so like this to me just seems like i'm so excited to hear more about this um but we have this picture and uh, a little bit of a description here instead of hanging around the farms of uh what could god forbid be considered working the aristocrats of east anglia we love this who, who wrote this copy congratulations all right, the aristocrats of East Anglia now stay in their manor houses and enjoy a properly leisure pursuit of countryside gentlemen or gentlewomen. 
that's very that's forward, very forward thinking, but you forgot the period. Okay, uh, and so we have this picture here, uh, and this manor house only has the ownership class in it. And you can see they own the subsistence farms and they own the rye farms, and um, they have a weekly balance. And I'm assuming they reinvest on the basis of, um, you know, whatever. Uh, well, I guess this ownership class is going to be the entirely agrarian and we're going to have a different building, non-manor house for capitalists, uh, and they'll have a different sort of thing. Um, but you can see dividends. And um, yeah, this is so exciting. No throughput though, obviously, because they just uh, they just are getting the weekly balance uh, of the dividends. But it shows how many levels you own as well. And I assume that these guys could just buy stuff in other areas. I don't know how exactly this will shake out. Um, but the fact that all the ownership is in a single building uh, is meaning that, uh, you know, we don't have additional, like, uh, I think this actually might even decrease the number of pop entities depending on how things shake out. Mm -hmm. That actually might be really good. We'll see how that shakes out um, for performance. Okay. Next up, we have Liberty Desire in patch 1.7. Uh, update 1.7 updates uh, adds Liberty Desire for subjects that restricts both which nations they can take... Uh, which actions, sorry, that they can take against their overlord, such as being able to join against them in a play, I assume, and which actions the overlord is able to take against them. I assume you can't try and annex someone if the liberty to desire is really high, maybe, and this would be a good thing, I think. Liberty desires calculated on a variety of factors, such as how intertwined the subject's economy is with their overlord, so making them highly dependent on your economy uh, in the market would maybe make it easier to annex them or this sort of thing, and can increase or decrease over time. AI subjects will have a new a number of new diplomatic strategies influenced by their liberty desire, such as pursuing independence or remaining a subject, but seeking great, greater autonomy. This is so great uh, because like <laughs> there's like weird scenarios where you could have a subject that's stronger than you that just doesn't make sense. EU4 does a good job of handling this. Um, if there's now a better way of handling this, this will be fantastic. Owning to a relatively high liberty desire, Cambodia is pursuing a strategy of increased autonomy and self-reliance, but will not seek full independence yet. So we have the attitude increase self-reliance so they want to be have they want to be their strong independent cambodia that don't need no siam i think or maybe it's dynam i can't remember who has overlordship over them at the start but okay oh vietnam so dynam okay uh, this, of course, is no means an exhaustive list of everything we're including in spheres of influence. There's new companies, new companies, baby, uh, new flavor events, more historical characters. Perhaps we'll, perhaps we'll receive the forbidden guy, but I very much doubt it. Um, <laughs> yeah, there's no reason to really include him, I don't think. Uh, new clothing and changes to the map, to name a few. Since there's a lot to talk about, we will be releasing Dev Diaries for... Uh, we will be releasing weekly dev diaries, that means a lot of Happy Thursdays, for the next couple of months. That's all for today. Next week, we begin the dive into 1.7 Spheres of Influence at the top of Power Blocks. Before you can see, below you can see the upcoming Dev's Diary schedule. So mark, <laughs> talking's hard, yeah. So mark down, oh wait, mark the dates down for when we go uh, over your topics of interest uh, on Happy Thursdays, okay. And no April Fool's Day, important to note. There's no April 1st in here. Uh, but next week will be Power Blocks, then Foreign Investment and Building Ownership. I'm probably most excited for this one. Um, then Subject Ownership or Subjects Interactions. After this, Lobbies and more on Power Blocks. Um, this will be great. The Power Blocks is probably the second thing I'm second most excited for. Uh, the Great Game, The Art of Spheres of Influence, and a Changelog for 1.7. Uh, and there we have it. That is an overview of the features that are going to be included in both uh, 1.7, vanilla base, and spheres of influence. I hope you enjoyed. If you did, please feel free to like, comment, subscribe, especially if you want to see updates uh, on this, uh, you know, every Thursday. Happy Thursday. Um, hit the notification bell, etc., mostly etc. And other than that, have a good day. Have a good Thursday.